Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Mike Thurston and Friends. Thank you for joining me. Let me tell you a little bit about my friend today. He was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, which is also where I started my career as a little boy growing up there. He then uh, lived in Germany. And as a young uh, person, he moved to the United States. He went to the High School of Performing Arts in New York, became a professional actor, singer, dancer, performed in many Broadway shows. And then he moved to the West Coast. He now lives here in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, his two children, uh, Dora and David, that he's very proud of, are also artists. But uh, he is most well known as one of Hollywood's uh, most uh, influential acting teachers and life coaches. He's uh, taught in over 26 countries. And his transformational techniques has, have basically revolutionized the business industry worldwide. Uh, but most important, more than more than all of that, which is you know wonderful, but why is he here with me today? And that's because he and his family have been very close and very special and meaningful to me and my family, especially my late parents uh, for decades, for many, many years. And it's a joy for me to welcome him today, uh, my friend, Bernard Hiller, or Bernardo, as I still call him. So, uh, Bernardo, welcome. Welcome to my- uh, Oh, thank you movie. very much. Of course, you call me Bernardo. That's that's my real name. And and, and Yiddish, your, what's your Bend name? It. Huh? Bend it. Bend it? Yeah, I've been a bend it. A bend it. A bend it. <laughs> bend it. Baruch <laughs> Bend it was my uh, grandfather's name. Oh. And so uh, I'm a bandit. My whole life has been a bandit. <laughs> and bandit, for those of you who don't know Yiddish, is uh, like a mamzer, you know? Which well, it's, is it's a thief. Quite. A bandit. A bandit. It's, it's a like bandit. A, a bandit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a bandit, you know? Well, thank you. Thanks for joining me. Uh, first of all, we are right now speaking during uh, the height. Again, once again, unfortunately, we are in the new year. Thank God. Uh, in 2021, but um, here in Los Angeles, the pandemic is raging right now. How are you doing? How are you coping? Are you okay? How's the family? Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's such an honor to, anytime I see a Burstein, it's, a, it's you're very, your whole family has been crucial to my life and to my development. And I loved your late father and mother. They were dear, dear friends. I performed for them for many, many years. Well, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that. We, we'll we, talk about that. Yeah. Um, I'm doing fine. You know, as we say uh, in French, which yeah. means we just got to carry along. And uh, I'm spending a lot of time in a place called Zoom. It's a Zoom world now. That's where we are. Yeah. That's where we are. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. We're, I, I, we're in I Zoom world. Know. We're in Zoom world. That's a new world. It's a Zoom world where I'm talking on Zoom. I have intim meetings on Zoom. I coach, as you know, I coach actors on Zoom from all over the world. But Zoom is like, uh, by the way, it's this, this Zoom is, has actually been able, I've been able to connect with people I would never connect with. Yeah, that's the, the positive uh, aspect of what's happened uh, technologically. Yes. Since this pandemic, but how has it changed your ability or the, the, the way you, you are able to coach and teach people? Has it changed? Well, has you know what? Improved? In some is ways, it, is it different? Yeah, I want to tell you, in some ways, it's very interesting. Uh, the Zoom, of course, uh, I've been doing master classes. I teach acting for the last, you know, 30 years. Uh, and I do master classes live. You go live. I do exercises. I do emotional exercises. It's about for my my whole technique is about transformation. Yeah, we we want to teach you how to become a dynamic human being. Then you become a dynamic actor. So we have all these exercises. And I'm so used to being in classes. You know, people we do this and we do that. Now we're on Zoom, and in some ways there's something interesting on Zoom because for actors will understand. 
it's like we're on camera right now. It's like camera work. One, we're on camera. And two, the students actually have to focus more to pay attention to what I'm saying because they don't have any place to look around. Everybody's really focused. In some ways, I had to teach a little differently, but it's having, it's having a very powerful effect. I, I've been doing a class for a year, a one-year class where we meet uh, three days every month from, from people around the world. We have like 40 actors from all over the world. And they've really learned a lot. We've and I've been able to bring in special guests from different countries. It's 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 quite something. It's now, different. In, in the past, you used to travel yes. uh, to all these countries yes. to give your master classes. Right. Obviously, you cannot travel. I am, so how has that changed? Do you do individual countries or can you have no all they're the all together one? They're all together in one time. In in English. In English, because my English is good, not as good as yours, but I but speak. You used to teach English. in French. You 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 would teach in in other countries in different. I, would, I have okay, so we'll explain the whole thing. Imagine forty people on the screen. Right. They we all. I start at ten o'clock, but ten o'clock for me is seven o'clock at night in Rome. Uh, it's at two in the morning in Australia. It's four o'clock a.m. in China. But I start at 10. you got to show up. So they show up. Now, the Italians have one person who's translating on a phone to everybody. But there's usually about five or six uh, that need that. The rest pretty much understand English. But anyone is translation is like they're like listening from the organizer to go from French, uh, from, well, English to Russian or whatever it is. It all works. It's kind of like, you know what it is? We figured it out because we use creativity. Somehow we make it through. We figure it out. Well, Some you know, uh, that's what I always say. The human being, mankind, has the ability, I don't know whether it's unique to us, to adapt. Just, it is. We have an ability, uh, you know, even in the worst situations, I don't want to compare it. Uh, right. Even during the darkest days, when you know, darkest days of the Holocaust, right? Of there course. were there were people who were able to look at their reality and say, "We have to get through this, and the only way to do that is why. be realistic and absolutely and and adapt to the reality." Let's, and let's be clear: that, those that that didn't want to do that, like some people. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what we're going through, what we went through this week here in, in Washington, who are not willing uh, to look reality in the face and adapt to it. So, uh, but that's it's fascinating because it's given you um, and and many of us artists the ability to reach out uh, across the world. Uh, instantly at the same time to so many people that we were not able to do in the past. It's it's miraculous. There, there is, like you said, there is a benefit for, we found something positive about Zoom. Of course, it doesn't, it's not as, as great as when you see it in person because we have, we want human touch. You know, we want, we want on hands, we want to do something, but you know what? We are the only species that use creativity to figure it out. And since you know, my family were all Holocaust survivors who had to hide in a hole in the ground for like a year and a, a year and a half. They had to somehow figure it out. And that's what we do. We figured it out. And it's not that comparison, but any kind of problem, we creativity. Thank God for that. From the great creator, we got creativity. And that's what we do. That's what we do for a living. We use creativity. We have a friend here in Los Angeles who is a survivor. She survived several concentration camps. She's turned 100 years now. She's a little petite little lady. But What's her name? Uh, Adela. Adela Mannheim. Okay. And Adela uh, told me the other day, we were complaining about what's going on. And she said, Michael, compared, everything is relative, compared to what I went through and what we went through, this is nothing. I mean, we, you know, I have, I have a home, I have warmth in winter, I have air conditioning in summer, I have food to eat, I have security, 
Uh, you just have to, you know. For and me, I have Netflix. That's what I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, tell me a little, remind me a little bit of when you worked with my late father and mother. Oh. Uh, what what show was it? Do you remember? First show. It was the first show I remember doing because I never, I didn't know that. Yiddish was up and alive in when I got to New York. I didn't really know the scene. So it's me. It's not not there was plenty of Yiddish shows going on. I just didn't know about it. I was doing American shows. And one day, the late David Carey, he's a wonderful actor, was doing well, thanks to you, I actually have a career because you're so famous. You left your parents and went for bigger things. And thanks to you, I had a job. So they were I think young, they were doing, Yeah, they needed a young, handsome Guy. Well, were... somebody, right. And so I went to the, I went and did a show called The Rebbitson from Israel. I think that's the one. Yeah. I think it was in the theater, it was on, on 46th Street. I think it was down on the bottom. And I came to the first day, and I remember because I was going to play every Tuesday or something like that. I don't know. And I remember the first words I said, and your father said, No, he's out. Terrible. He died. Hot nishaton. He's not like, hey, like, hey, where are you going? Not, I was saying, hey, where are you? No, you got to go. Hey, Bastista, where are you going? So he said, no, no, no. And David Carey talked him into, like, no, listen, I have, I'm busy. He's got to go on for me. All right. And that's where I also was with my dear friend who I've known for 50 years, Elliot Finkel. Elliot Finkel played the piano. My God. And so he was there. And then I started. And then your father sort of came around to me because he was amazing. I was like, because I was song and dance man, I could sing and dance. He was like, oh, this is something. <laughs> and so I, so I had the pleasure of learning from your father, a FIFA, a thing. And I always heard about Mike, Mike, okay, I'm not Mike Borstein, but I did my thing. And then I got to, of course, go on with your mother, many, many shows with my with my wife, it was your 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 whole family taught me so much. I would say your family, and of course the Finkel family. I worked with him. I worked with them, and I worked with Fiveish on so many shows and Yiddish we, shows. And we everything. just lost Ian. You know. I know. I was just Thank I was you. just at the memorial, and of course I heard about it. Yeah. And Ian, who was Elliot's brother, the greatest xylophonist in the world. It's uh, interesting. My father, God bless him, may he rest in peace. He gave Fivish his first part. Fivish right. was 18 years old, and this was a musical uh, back in the uh, 40s. And Fivish was a young actor, but he wasn't a member right. of the Hebrew Actors Union. Yeah. The Actors Union, uh, the Performing Artists Union that predates equity. It was the first Performing Artists Union, the Yiddish actors, and they were very protective uh, these old guys, uh, they didn't want young actors to right. come in and take their play. Right. So they would audition actors. You had to pass an audition right. to be able to get into the union. And they didn't want five-ish. And right. my father needed a young actor. And my father went to bat for five-ish. And he said to them, to the old guys at the union, if you can give me an 18-year-old actor, I'll take him. Otherwise, this kid is going to be in my show. And he was. And Fivish never forgot that. It started his career. And he did the same thing for Elliot. Elliot's first job as a pianist in a show was with my dad. So, and listen, I, your father, God bless him, uh, was, I remember uh, the last time I saw him was at a birthday party. Remember here in the Valley? He did yes. a birthday party for him. Your sister was always so kind to my mother. Oh, it's more than just friendship. It's oh really, no, it's it's a family. I feel it, felt it, so close to them and and to your whole Burstein family. You've been, you know, I I I have such nachas when I see you performing. I used to come see you on Broadway and uh, just seeing your shows. I'm just quelling well, what you are doing and your whole your family. No, they're family to me. Your your mother and father were family to me, and I I really truly loved them. So tell me how you uh, uh, you transformed from being an actor, a singer, a performer into what you have developed. How did you develop this? How did you get interested in it? And what was the process? 
that brought you to what you're doing now, which has influenced so many uh, performers. Uh, you even you even coached uh, uh, very famous actors in Yiddish when they had to work, right? That's right. Well, I coached uh, Billy Crystal. Uh, I, I wrote Yiddish scenes. I was the Yiddish coach of the stars. What they, that's what they used to call me. And then I had a call from Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks. And whenever, even the Cohen brothers, there's a scene, uh, there's a Yiddish part in the beginning of the uh, of the movie called, uh, what's it called? I forgot the name of the movie, where the first for Five-ish is in that. Right, Alan. Uh, actually, Five-ish was in that. Yeah, yeah. And was that it? scene and Alan Rickman and his wife. Uh, no, I think I, I no, I think it was the beginning. The Cohen brothers. Anyway, I wrote that scene in Yiddish. I wrote it in Yiddish, so they would have it. No, they were, I forgot. I think I think it was somebody else in it. I forgot the name of it, but there was a Cohen brothers movie, and so I started doing. I first of all, the reason that took me out here, is I did a movie called Avalon. Sure. And Avalon, I played. Um, Fuchs, what's his first name? The Fuchs. Uh, Leo. Leo Fuchs. Yeah. I played him younger. Yeah. So I played Mina, him. Mina was in that. Mina Burns. Yes. Mina. They were all there. All of them were there. Yeah. And Minnie and Lou Jacoby. And it was like, and his wife, it was like everybody was there. And Moshe Rosenfeld, he was also one of the guys. And, and we did all the scenes in Yiddish. And we were doing all the scenes in Yiddish. So they said, well, I think you should be, you know, helping people. I said, okay, we figure out what we're going to be doing. We're getting off the boat. There are scenes when he gets off the boat and he comes to, uh, he comes to America and we're speaking Yiddish. And I played the, uh, the Leo Fuchs character. And so because after that, uh, uh, Barry Levinson, who was great, said, you should come to L.A. And I always wanted to come to L.A. And somebody, I had, I had taught a little bit of acting in, in, in New York. And uh, they said, would you help me out? And I said, okay. And then they got a job. And so it started really small. And then all of a sudden, two people came. Now I had two students. I didn't really think about becoming a teacher. I would never plan on being a teacher. But then something magical happened where somebody asked me, would you come and teach a class in Paris in the year 2000 for five weeks in Saint-Germain-de-Pré? I said, wow. sure. That's that's like sure I'll go why not, <laughs> and so uh, so I came but I didn't I had to kind of build a curriculum and I always thought that acting wasn't taught as well as I wanted it to I think that actors should be taught about how to succeed I think that's something that people don't deal with also people in general are not taught how to succeed in life and how to deal with the ups and downs and what to do with your career you're just sometimes given training and then good luck and hope for the best. And I didn't want to do that. I thought actors should create their own opportunities and make their own things, um, pretty much like uh, you know uh, Avi's doing. Avi Hoffman is creating your opportunities. I think that's the secret. Anyway, so I started to create something, and then more students came. But it was such an explosion when I was in Paris. The class exploded because it was kind of life coaching. It was transformation. It was like you became aware who you were. It wasn't just about acting. Because I always thought they should go together. So to me, it's life, because acting is acting is a journey to yourself. And I've discovered this is what I teach that if you're a dynamic person, you'll be a dynamic actor. But if you got goonish going on, man, you got goonish on stage. Just you have to bring something to have something. You cannot give me what you do not have. So I started teaching. I've been to Rome now fifty times. Like all Italy, I feel Italy knows me, and there are Spain and my books, and and all of a sudden they were people were coming, and then you know, and so I miss going to those places because I love Italy. I mean, I love I could go there tomorrow. I love Rome. Well, you will. Hey, listen, uh, this is God willing. It, yes. it's eventually, we'll yes. get back to that. Did you ever run into to a man in Jack Garfine in Paris? You know what? I heard about Jack Garfine and I knew I spoke to him just before he died. I heard all about him. I didn't know his background. I would have gone seen him. I would have known, my God, if I knew his Garf. I remember always see when I was in Paris, I always heard about Jack Garfine. People go there. And I heard about it. But I thought he was a, I heard he was a wonderful teacher, but I didn't know his background. I would have gone about his Holocaust background. Of course, survivor and uh he worked with so many people. He oh, no, no, no. He was very well known and very appreciated. And in, in some ways, I, uh, 
after coming to LA, LA, there's a, there's an interesting uh, thing about LA, which is when I came here, I didn't know anybody, but uh, somebody told me it's not who you know in Hollywood, but who'd want to know you. And so I thought, okay. And so I was very lucky to meet different actors and, and they, and I said, I wanted to work with them also on different projects so I can produce something. I just wrote a screenplay. So all of a sudden I feel like I've never left acting. I just went to a different direction, which has brought me where I'm able to make more decisions about, I want to make projects. I'm, I'm meeting other actors. We're always creating something. The teaching, which I never thought would help uh, me in, in a strong way was been the greatest, the greatest blessing. Because my mother get, was you, right. You get the same amount of satisfaction as you do when you're performing. You know what? I get the same satisfaction because I, I love performing. I did a, I, I, I did a lot of shows. I did, you know, um, the Golden Land. I mean, when I was performing, but I, I always feel like that's just part of me. I love what I'm doing at the time. I love performing. I love teaching. I love writing. I love producing. I love all of it. It's not one or the other. I just love doing different things. And I've been very fortunate to be able to do some of that. How does your, uh, I hate to call it method because yeah. it's kind of, a, you know, I have my own views about yeah. um, act, a, acting schools. I have my own view of that. But how does it differ from the ideals of uh, Stanislavski or a, uh, a, um, the acting uh, schools in New York, the Uta Hagens? Uh, is there anything similar to what they uh, used that you've incorporated or is yours completely unique uh, and original? First of all, I'm always standing on the shoulders of giants. I always have taken, but the word method means a way. And if you're going to do this and this and it makes you great, that's your way. There isn't one way. There is, you got to find your way. It's not like I impose. I would say my method is very organic because acting for me is playing different parts of yourself. You don't actually play somebody else, but you become that person because in us lives everything. And so you need to discover different parts of you, not playing acting because acting has been canceled. It doesn't work anymore. You have to be that person. You have to become that person. And in you live, and in you and me lives a good person, a bad person, a funny person. You know, we have the ability to do different things, but it's not easy to discover them. And so there's a winner in you, a loser in you. There's a winner in everybody. And so the idea is that what acting is, is gives us an opportunity to, to, to discover different parts of who we are. And to bring humans, not to have, there's a saying, which is, if I can see you acting, you're doing it wrong. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can see, we can see him. Yeah, because, and because acting has not been taught well and not done well, a new industry came out called reality television. Reality television is a direct result, no, of acting that's not good. Because they rather watch six people in the house. I mean, people are watching. And this comes from, I remember Candid Camera. Remember the Candid Camera? Oh, sure. Candid Camera is very interesting in my uh, development of my training. Candid Camera, all of a sudden, there used to be like a teacup or something, and it's talking to somebody. You know, the joke was a teacup is talking. And the guy is really reacting to this teacup talking. But it's real. See, there's something interesting about that. It's, there's no acting going on. It's like, oh, let's say my phone was just like talking to me. Like, hey, you know, like you're really in the moment. And because some, I have to say, I have seen, there's a, there's a show called um, Undercover Boss. Have you yes. ever seen it? I, I've seen a couple of them, yeah. I am telling you, it's very emotional. It's emotional. This Undercover Boss, very famous boss, a big company, goes undercover, and he's like some billionaire, works with regular people who are struggling and who are, don't have enough money to eat, and, and they're just working, and I got three jobs, and he's hearing their story, their sad story. And they're all pretty tragic. And then comes the best part. They're supposed to come to the company to talk about this guy, the employee that was working with them, who turns out to be the boss. And he says, listen, your mother died. And so uh, I'd like to pay for four years of your college. This guy's, they're in it. They're like, oh my God. And I know you don't have anybody coming to your, uh, when you graduate high school, I'm going to be there. 
And one after, it's like, oh, Gavalt, is that the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? And it's the idea that people are dying for truth, that we need to be, our actors have to be even more real so we just don't all watch reality television because some of it is real. I mean, the word is real in the reality. Of course, there's a lot of garbage. We're not talking about that, but there are some shows people are watching. And so uh, I wanted to teach a technique that helps you. And then you take what you like. If it makes you great, great. And you take from everybody. Because I always believe that you, as an actor, you got to figure out what is the best way to make you work. And the big thing that all the big stars do, that I know some of them from DiCaprio to some other people, is that they always ask for help. And they're always working with somebody. Leonardo DiCaprio had three Academy Award nominations. And then he said, you know what? I need to get a coach. And that's what it is. Because if you're not getting better, you're getting bitter. Because acting is growing all the time. And acting demands are growing. And I'm trying to change what I'm doing all the time. Like what I was teaching last week, I better teach something new. Because it, life is moving on. Like, you know, like this pandemic. It's making everyone change. You have to change with the times. And so that's what we're doing. And unfortunately, right now, so many of our uh, colleagues in our industry are suffering yes. and have been suffering almost for a year now, since February, March of last year. And um, thank God for some organizations like the Actors Fund, for example, which I constantly promote. Uh, and I'll put a little a blurb up on uh, the screen when I broadcast this because, uh, you know, an actor who is not working is basically a nothing. I mean, if you're, a, if you're a, a shoemaker or a watchmaker and you have no work, you can still practice your craft. Right. So you don't lose it. Sitting at home, you can work on a watch or work on, you know, but an actor who is not performing is really um horrible no but all the technicians everybody i got singers i got sure. everybody in, in our just, industry and it yeah. is uh it is serious but especially you know young uh young actors every year yeah they finish college they come to new york with their dreams and of course you know the first thing you need is to realize uh that you need what it takes i mean talent is so important in our business and and what what hurts me sometimes is people take advantage of these young kids who come in and are desperate uh and want to work but it's obvious that they don't have the uh, the ability or the kaleen the the uh, the instrument uh, to succeed and they're just going to waste their lives and um, I saw that uh, when I was fortunate uh, to be allowed to sit in on auditions when we did uh, Jolson years ago we did a tour and I played Al Jolson and I was allowed to sit in on the auditions I saw I saw you in Al Jolson you were brilliant thank you thank you and I, I sat there and I watched young kids coming in to audition and it was so obvious that I wanted to just, you know, scream out, hey, listen, please don't waste your life. You don't have what it takes. Go home, you know, get a life and don't, you know, uh, be dis, you know, have the illusion that you might become a performer on Broadway. But obviously, you can't tell them that. No, you yeah. can't. But here's, but the, here's the thing. I'm just going to not, you know, I'm just going to disagree with you a little tiny bit. I think the problem, which is, I think, an epidemic problem, my feeling, is that I think there's only 10 great teachers in the world. And if you don't study with 10 of the great teachers, you will never become something. That's and my I, point. That's, that's my that's point. My and point. some of the other teachers take advantage Okay. Well, they don't know. They don't, they, you know, the idea is that uh, Uta Hagen, who the famous said that acting is the worst taught subject on the planet. And after a while, I thought, you know what, she's right. And I, I wanted to do something to be able to push them and learn and teach them because they're hungry. But, you know, you you never can get better than your coach. If your coach is not brilliant, you're not going to be brilliant. And you had brilliant teachers. I mean, where you were 
super talented, but look, you come from a talented family. You started three, whatever. You had your parents. Who did you learn from? You didn't go to, right, you didn't, right. You watching didn't, him. Yeah. Watching him, you saw the best. So, yeah. but, so what was it? You didn't go to an acting school. You learned about that. You were performing right on stage and learned the best things. And I, I you know, I, I, I think that's the key. The key is trying to find someone. That's you have to have a muzzle. You have to have really a muzzle to find timing I, I, and luck and muzzle. Luck, you know, I, I've I've seen I saw a documentary in Juilliard about Juilliard, and a great great teacher was talking about that. He was very disappointed after four years of Juilliard which is the finest training, why some of them became uh, money managers, why they went into a different business. And I was thinking, yeah, because you never taught them how to succeed because talent is important, but it's not the most important. It's your state of mind. It's who you are. It's constantly learning. It's constantly growing. And they weren't doing that. And how to use your instrument. How do you, how to know what your instrument is? Exactly. What are you good for? Exactly. You need something like that. You need an awakening. You need somebody to- One of us is unique. I always, I remember my teacher saying that you need to find a mentor because a mentor can help you find a place in yourself that you could never find by yourself. And that's the key. All right, Bernardo. Hi, Gavalt. Yeah, we could, we could go on and on. Um, uh, I want to ask you before we conclude, something I, I ask uh, my friends, uh, when uh, we when we talk about life in general, but uh, if I were to ask you for uh, one individual that inspired you in your life, whether it's professionally or personally, who would you, who would that be? I would say that the person that inspired me the most was my mother. And the reason she was the most inspirational because she came from a little town called Lenin. It's in Belarus. It's a little village, which nine months ago, before the pandemic, probably like 10 months ago, I was there. I, after all these years, I went to a little town of Lenin. She came from a little village. But in this little village, in one little shtibel, they had theater. And she wanted to be an actress. And then the then the war started and they killed everyone there. It's a long story in Lenin, they, the, you know, the, the Germans and everybody. So she always wanted to be, and that's, I would say that I was so inspired by them and my father who loved your parents and just said to me uh, that being, a, because I didn't, first of all, when, when I was doing it, I was like, well, I want to do American thing. I don't want to do Yiddish shows. I was doing so many Yiddish shows. And she said, but they'd like to hear that you would sing in Yiddish. And then when I came out of the 12th Street Theater on 2nd Avenue, the 12th Street Theater, the famous uh, Maurice Schwartz Theater. Maurice Schwartz is there. Yeah, when I came out of there, I saw all the Holocaust survivors just beaming. They could hear a Yiddish word. And I thought, oh, how beautiful a language. And, uh, and then from then on, I realized that that was an important thing to do and I would say my mom kept inspiring me I mean she she was the one who said keep going always keep going and she was the smartest person I knew she was always an inspiration to me she is you know it's up to us uh to carry on that flame and that uh culture uh both Absolutely. with the Yiddish language because otherwise uh it'll disappear and we are losing that generation every day uh, slowly slowly they are disappearing and if it's not if we don't continue their legacy nobody will and the language is so much a part of it yiddish was right. the language of the little children you know before the, the language was well, the, the, all the shows all the plays you know it was uh, the language uh, you know if not for the Holocaust, a million and a half Jewish children, a great majority of them, their mother tongue was not Polish or Russian, it was Yiddish. Right. And well, uh, yeah. That, I mean, that would have continued. Uh, so you and I, and uh, people like uh, Avi, uh, unfortunately, my, my dear friend, Brucey Adler, who we lost 
at a young age. Uh, very. By the way, I always went, I, I, I sub for Brucey. When he couldn't do it, I came in. I was the sub for you and Brucey, so I'm number two. That's ich bin number zwei. Nicht der erste, aber no. I would come in for Brucey when he wasn't able to do it. And what a great performer he was. Uh, and, well, uh, you know, uh, that's what I try to do among all the other things that I'm doing. Every once in a while, I go back and do, I do a Yiddish recording or a Yiddish uh, concert, uh, either here or in Israel. And it's, it's so important to me that Yiddish doesn't become Latin. I mean, they teach Latin in universities all over the world but nobody speaks Latin. It's not a spoken language. They teach Yiddish all over the world, but we make we have to make sure that people still uh, hear the spoken Yiddish, what it sounded like. So uh, you I, and I have to... Uh, I think, listen, I am very connected. If there's anything you need my help, I think this is the most important thing. But somehow I feel that Yiddish, the death of Yiddish has been told many, many years for forever. It's always the end, but Yiddish will not end. It just will not end. They're the beautiful, you know, when with Avi's, uh, you know, uh, events, all of a sudden he's got people from around the country, people from here. It's just, it's amazing how people, Yiddish does has a life. There's something about it. Having, it's a, having a renewal. Yeah. My father always used to say, people have been saying that Yiddish was dying for a hundred years. Those, right. people are, those people are gone and Yiddish is still here. They've I died, think, but Yiddish is still here. Yeah, I mean, and, and I want to say that your family had so much to do with it, brought so much joy, and so did you. What a great performer you are. My God, not to have you on stage right now is a crime because you are a fabulous performer. And, and so thank you for the whole Burstein family. Well, look, uh, I, I have also decided that as we mature, um, you know, I don't like to keep doing things that I've done before and just treading water. You know, I've done so many things in my career. I've been so lucky from the age of seven in Buenos Aires, as you know, where I started. And uh, I now have decided to try and do things uh, that I haven't done before. I'm always looking for a new challenge. So That's I directed, it. I wrote and directed my first feature film uh, three years ago in Israel called Azim. Uh, we will be, we'll be putting it up on, uh, on Amazon Prime pretty soon. And I'm now directing, uh, interestingly, dubbing uh, for Netflix. Uh, I direct the dubbing, the English language dubbing of all the foreign series that Netflix purchases because they, you know, everything now is streaming. And so it's a new challenge that I- So are they dubbing, dubbing into Yiddish? Is no, anything into in Yiddish? English, into English. Wow. Into English, sure. Because uh, any foreign, right now I'm beginning an Italian series uh, that is going to be released uh, worldwide by Netflix, what they do is they get a foreign series and then they dub it uh, in addition to the original language, the let's say this Italian, it gets dubbed into English, French, uh, Portuguese, uh, Russian, whatever, wherever. I did a lot of dubbing. I did a lot of dubbing. I did a lot of dub for German and for, for Yiddish. I exactly. And so that's a new challenge for me. Uh, to do things I haven't done before that that uh, makes sense as I, I won't say get older, but as I mature, so that I I've got an each time I, I need a new challenge, something that I you know. Of course, I, you need a new challenge. Oh, By the way, let me know when you get older. I don't know when that's going <laughs> to happen because the secret of success is don't grow up. Don't grow up. Old is not good. There's well, no. As yeah, someone, someone, yeah, go ahead. someone told me recently what Clint Eastwood said. He was on a golf course with a friend, and he's in his 80s. And his friend said, uh, "How do you maintain your youthful uh, image and your youthful, you know, character?" He said, "Because I don't let the old man in." That's right. That's exactly what right. It's all about don't let the old man in. No, no, but who needs him? But that's who what needs him? No, because only the young. This is what I teach. Only the young have new ideas. It's not your grandmother's going to discover, you know, Apple computer. It's people who have young, son, young in mind. It's not young. You have to be young. But since I teach around the world, 
I would say the people who are young are the ones who are thinking, hey, I love this dubbing idea. Why not? This leads to something else. There was a saying my mother always said, gay vs. gate. And that means just go where things are going. And that's why I took this job. I took another job that I didn't really want, which turned out to be like I did West Side Story and there was Leonard Bernstein in Europe. I didn't want to go there. She said, it's going, right? You go with it where it's going. And so you have to go with the flow. That's the thing. Go with the flow. Stop. Yeah, my, my, my first wife, when she met rest in peace, always said, you don't have to push the river. It flows on its own. Right. And we don't know where it's going. And it's yeah. a ride. It, you got to be like, going you got on the ride. It's a ride. Look, this is this, this right now, the uh, democracy, it's a ride. It's up, it's down. But it'll come down. Don't worry. Shh. It turns and turns, and then shh, January 20th, shh, quiet. <laughs> Bernardo, can I put up, uh, when we uh, when I yes. do this, I'd like to put up your website. Yes, anytime. I will put it up. BernardHiller.com, anytime, any of your, anybody listening, I love it, and I'm going to put it down on my site. Great. And uh, I am always here for you. Uh, you are talented. You are the ultimate mensch. Thank you for doing that and speaking for you. The only thing I'm using, I'm a little disappointed. Where's the locks? You said it's a green room. Where's the locks? There's no locks here. What's uh, happening? There's a lock on my door. Oh, <laughs> where the locks are. I see. That's why. That's why you, you told me once. You you can't. Uh, why can't you keep Jews in prison? They eat the locks. I know yeah. that's what you told me. <laughs> <laughs> Bernardo, thank you. Right. See you later. Zayme yeah. gesund. Zygazine, which is the most important. Yes, thing. health, health, new yeah. health. I mean, and uh, I want to thank your wife, to your beautiful wife that I always see, and uh, your children and everyone else. And you're always, you're always in my heart. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you next time on uh, Mike Burstyn and uh, Friends. Shalom. <laughs>